Hello, I'm Andrew Goddard. I'm the President-Elect of the Royal College of Physicians uh, and I'm here with Jennifer Dixon, who is Chief Executive uh, of the Health Foundation. And we're going to spend some time talking about uh, the NHS and how we see that's going to be going in the future uh, and try and focus on the role of doctors within the NHS. So, hi, Jennifer. Hello. Do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself uh, and then we'll sort of wade in to the problems that we're going to face? <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I currently am the Chief Executive of the Health Foundation, which is one of the largest uh, UK foundations working in healthcare. Um, and my background is in medicine, and I'm very pleased to be a fellow of the uh, college here. Um, so I've been working in foundation land for about 20 years, and most of that time I've been analysing the shape of the NHS, how, um, how much money it needs, what shape it should have, how it can accelerate change for the future. Um, and also looking at other international systems about how they are um, developing and what we have to learn from them. So really a background in empirical analysis, I would say, and was only on the wards for about five years as a okay. paediatrician, in fact. Okay, so, um, so you're a doctor. Yep. How do you think the role of doctors within hospital healthcare in the NHS is going to change over the next 10 years or so? Yeah. Well, um, there's what will happen and what should happen, okay. I suppose. Um, well, I think um, the first thing is, the obvious point is that, um, just to st start the macro, um, all health systems are living beyond their means at the moment. Um, healthcare costs are rising faster than GDP growth. And at the same time, there's more demand on the system, as everybody working in the NHS knows, demand from increased um, to, um, uh, illnesses, increased uh, risk factors, and also the demands because we all want better technology, we want better drugs and treatments and so on. Uh, and at the moment, as I say, healthcare costs are outstripping by twofold GDP growth, so we, we can't afford the kind of rate of increase, which is um, historically in the NHS has been about 4%, will be 3.4% going forwards real terms growth. So something has to give there, and I think what we see over the last 20, 30 years is the limits to the reforms of the NHS, the top-down reforms that some of, of people watching this video will absolutely remember. Yeah. You know, the competition, the Lansley reforms, um, payment by re uh, results, different ways of paying for care, different ways of prodding the system to get more out of it. And um, physicians will have been on the receiving end of some of those things. Um, when I started in uh, practicing, and nobody knew who the chief executive of the hospital was. No one knew how things were priced. Now, everything has changed. I think most doctors will know what payment by results is, for example, and people know who the chief executive of the NHS is and their hospitals. So I think there's more awareness of this pressure and the need to do more with less and the need to accelerate quality. So I think what we are now going to see in future is a far more focus at the clinical front line on how to make change, uh, as well as the top-down approach that everyone has known, because we now see the limits of that top-down approach. So what does that mean in practice? I think it means that um, physicians will have to think more and more beyond the treatment of the individual patients and think far more about taking responsibility for the whole service in bigger numbers than they have before and also skilling up in, um, in, in ways to accelerate change rather than just, importantly though it is, improve the medicine for individual patients. Um, so um, tackling sepsis, tackling the efficiency of care, tackling long, long pathways that duplicate, um, create risks, are unsafe, to make them leaner and sharper and so on, working with patients to reduce waste and uh, improve care, um, using quality improvement techniques, working hand in hand with managers more, and really saying, this is my role as a doc. It is absolutely to take responsibility for the population of patients now and in the future who are likely to need this service and to make things as lean as possible to make the public pound go more. So I think that kind of change in zeitgeist, which is already beginning and is absolutely in evidence in, in some places, particularly in hospitals, is really going to take off a lot more and hopefully aided by technology. Okay, so we'll come on to technology because I think that's, that's a, uh, a really interesting area. Uh, I think sort of there is a bit of a feeling the morale in amongst the medical profession is pretty low and a lot of people feel sort of done unto yeah. and feel helpless, uh, sort of this, this feeling of learned helplessness or actually 
yes, they would like to um, get involved in quality improvement, they would like to improve their service, but either they don't have the time because of they're just on the hamster wheel going faster and faster trying to deliver care because that's what they can do and that's yeah. where they can feel they're making a difference. Yeah. Uh, but also the systems aren't really in place to facilitate them getting involved and making change. I think there is a group of people who feel they don't have those skills and so clearly we're going to have to try and help give them the skills to get into quality improvement. But the, the pressure on the NHS is yeah. such at the moment that I, I think people are really struggling with that. So. Uh, and we, you know, so one of the things that we see is all the jobs that are advertised for new consultants, and yeah. we're seeing increasingly more so-called nine-one jobs, where nine ninety percent of the time is down for face-to-face -face clinical contact, and ten percent of the time is there to try and develop yourself and develop the service. But trusts don't seem to recognise the importance of clinicians leading and trying to develop their services. They just want people at the front door delivering the service there and then. How, yeah. how, how do we change from that, yes. that doctors are just there to deliver to doctors are there to lead change? Yes. How are we going to do that? Well, I think there's uh, twofold things. Um, the first is let's start with management. Um, it's absolutely true. If you look at the most outstanding hospitals, five outstanding hospitals in the country that the CQC has rated, you can see a different kind of culture in those hospitals. You see a facilitating management, not a authoritarian management. Yeah you see them giving clinicians the space to make time to be able to make changes, to skill up changes, an absolute emphasis on quality, not money. Um, and this is suffused down the system. Uh, Salford, for example, Northumbria is another example. Frimley, um, you could see the difference there that uh, when they twinned with Wexham Park to completely change around the ratings within a year. Um, so this is partly about management culture and an understanding in future that the way to progress is not just to look up but it's to look at the front line where actually most of the talent in the system is. Um, so there's a big agenda there for management which can't be underestimated but nevertheless in this highly pressurised system some places are doing it and it's increasingly obvious over time that those that have this different culture are outstanding. Um, and you know, where Salford is now taking over and twinned with um, Pennine Acute, you can begin to see changes there. And uh, a lot of this is, is, is um, um, freeing up um, clinical talent and making the space, giving them cover to make changes. But quite frankly, it's also about calling some clinicians about their challenging behaviours. Um, now, those are, will be uh, hopefully a minority of people, but nevertheless, if clinical behaviour is going unchallenged, then you can see how it can pollute the rest of the organisation with managers then being frightened of tackling very talented people who behave badly. So um, I would say that's a minority of issues, but it's very iconic in the system. Yeah. So this means a different type of management for starters. Um, the second um, element, pillar, is clinical leadership itself. Um, it's very easy, isn't it, for all of us to say um, uh, the system is, is under pressure, which it is, and therefore I can't do my job because of X and Y, some, which is also true. Um, but nevertheless, we, what we do see is that there are some clinical leaders who do make a difference under these very challenging circumstances. Um, they do make progress, they do sort of rise above. So I think there needs to be, I think, um, this sounds a bit rich for someone who's not at the coal face, therefore is not facing this pressure. But from outside, what I can see is there is a real need for clinicians to really step up and say, this next era is going to be different for us. We are going to take some more control than we have. Um, and without getting all sort of abstract, if you think of reform over the last 30 years, they've re it's really focused on the unit of a hospital or an institution, the general practice, the and the hospital, the community service, the mental health and so on, the ambulance sector. But I think that's going to slightly pivot in future and we will now think of how to influence communities of practitioners to do the right thing instead and to make change there. And if you think of all the clinicians in the country who are, who are active in clinical communities and clinical networks, in specialty societies, there's a whole set of changes that can be spread and diffused across the system now that's happening in one place but not another through that kind of 
telegraph system rather than the statutory accountability lines which go straight up to, to Simon Stevens and Jeremy yeah. Hunt and indeed so so um, so I think there's opportunities there for clinicians but it does mean breaking cover a bit and perhaps, perhaps stepping up to 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 um, think far more about the system as I've said and also management and also getting much more au fait with um, that land, that speak, that logic, which I think sometimes us clinicians can live in another world, can't we? Yeah, so you, you mentioned their eras, as I sort of you think. Don Berwick talks about three eras of medicine as he sees it, you know, the, the, the pre-regulation era when doctors were running wild and there are all sorts of variations in practice, and then with things like Shipman, moving to a sort of rather over-regulated era that we're in at the moment yeah. um, and hope to try and get to one where health professionals, not just doctors, are a bit more autonomous and have a bit more control over the health service that they are shaping and leading. Um, you know, the, all, all the occupational literature says that for you get most out of, you get the most pr productivity from a workforce that is happy and autonomy is one of the key features of, of, of happiness at work. So I'm quite interested to know how the system is going to develop to allow doctors to be leaders and be a bit more autonomous without the top-down sort of control that you've, you've talked about that. Because the NHS is such an expensive and uses up so much of the, the money, and as, as we sit here you know, a couple of days ago, um, 20 billion for the NHS was announced by the Prime Minister, everybody's focusing on the money much, much more. And mm -hmm. even in response to that, Jeremy Hunt was talking about this is, and May was talking about this is only going to happen if there is an increase in productivity mm -hmm. and we get rid of waste. And I think most doctors are completely on board with getting rid of variation and the getting it right first programme mm -hmm. is it's a good example of where we want to make sure that we are sort of removing the, 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 the poor performing bits of the health service. But I'm really struggling in my own heart to see how we can get the sort of levels of increase in productivity that I think perhaps our leaders envisage without it becoming, and at the same time, having enough autonomy to then develop the service. Yeah. You know, we've seen year on year increases in emergency activity in hospitals, uh, and we have become more efficient. So 10 years ago, we were putting uh, for, the, for the average emergency urgent care bed in the NHS. Ten years ago, we were getting 29 people through. Now we get 58 people through a year. Yeah. You know, we've, and we've really made the NHS much faster and efficient. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, we're reaching the bottom of a U-shaped curve. And in my hospital, we are currently getting planning permission to build extra beds onto the side of the hospital. And I know mm -hmm. other hospitals in the UK that are doing that because the NHS is full. So I'm, I'm, I'm just slightly concerned that if we focus too much on productivity, mm -hmm. that, uh, again, that, that opportunity for system change will, will be lost. Uh, I, I really believe that we've got to get health and social care together and, and the vision of the five-year forward view, as was, uh, is the right one um, and trying to deliver as much care to people outside of hospitals is, is a good thing but we're seeing that you know general practice is, is losing GPs mm -hmm. uh, on a fairly rapid basis hospital doctors feel really under the cosh mm. um, so we live in challenging times so if if you had uh, the opportunity to have a five-year forward view <laughs> what, what, from this point because I yeah. think we were in a better place than we were five mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, what, what will be your five-year forward view? Um, um, so I, I agree with you about the five-year forward view. I think it's absolutely in the right direction. And um, for ease of clarity, it's about collaboration as opposed to competition, yeah. which is a good thing. Um, and it's at last bringing agencies together to talk, share data, um, look at risk stratification, look at the whole pathway together and to see um, if avoidable risks can be reduced um, to offset further admissions to hospital, which as you say are absolutely rising in numbers, but also the intensity. Yeah. Um, you know, 10 years ago, one in um, one in um, ten ho people had five or more chronic conditions. Now it's one in three, yes. and it's quite considerable, as you know. 
Um, I think that um, we live in the NHS, it's a centralised tax funded system there will always be the pressure to have top-down some kind of reform. Yeah. So people will be tweaking at targets, performance management, um, some element of financial incentives. They'll be um, tweaking the financial physiology to nudge the system or shove it more like into a better place. But as I was saying earlier, I don't think that's going to be enough for the future. I think one of the things that should happen going forward is that there should be um, attention to management generic um, management and to for uh, managers across the system to learn from the best and now that we understand the best because we've got the CQC to sort of help um, that's one thing I think to help um, clinical people to make change and understand how they can make incremental change in their own department out with any management um, permissions that's another big thing that needs to be done and how to do that um, intelligently is a big question which is now on on the table um, I think that the way that we um, assess, spot and help to diffuse technologies that might help to um, offload some routinized work off the clinicians uh, and help with the pressure is incoherent at the moment and needs the, the, job, the dots need to be joined up. Um, I think um, there's a huge agenda there that perhaps we can talk about later. Yeah. Um, so those are some things, but I guess first and foremost is uh, even if you have the resources in the NHS, even if we've got 4%, not 3.4% real terms growth, we do not have the workforce at the moment. You know, we've got 100,000 vacancies in, across the NHS. At the moment, as you say, the number of GPs has gone down and the number, scary number, want to retire early. So we have got to tackle that first and foremost. And in fact, the Prime Minister a couple of days ago said that um, a workforce strategy is going to be absolutely critical. Um, clearly, we've got um, uh, what is it? One in um, one in three, one in four doctors were trained overseas. So we have enormous reliance, as everybody knows, on overseas trained physicians, doctors. Half of whom come from the EU, half of whom come from non-EU countries. Non-EU, the tier two visas have has now hopefully been relaxed. The requirements. And on the EU, well, who knows, because of Brexit, and that's the big, big worry, isn't it? So a, a proper workforce plan would help, a strategy, but absolutely immediate terms um, to tackle retention for nurses in particular and uh, general practice, those are first in line. Yeah. Uh, I, I would completely agree. So, yeah, I've done, done the maths looking just for medicine, yeah. and I would reckon that we need just under 3,000 more medical students Based, I mean, the, w so when you're looking at the work, and workforce planning is an oxymoron. Yeah. Uh, and it, you, whatever happens, you'll always get it wrong. However, you know, we we know that so many more people are going to be retiring in ten years' time than are currently because we had a big expansion mm -hmm. twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. We know that workload is likely to go up, and you can actually model, and because it has been a linear progression over decades, we know how much activity you're going to need. We know that the workforce is changing, and yes. it comes to retention mm -hmm. the, within the workforce. But that so many more people want to work less than whole time, and they want to work flexibly. Yeah. But at the moment, none of our workforce planning takes that into account. We just think yeah. about headcounts. We don't think about how those people are going to want to work. You know, forty-two percent of female physician consultant positions work less than full time. Yeah. Um, yet that that isn't factored in. So the trouble is, you you factor all those things out, and you get start to get really scary numbers yeah. about the number, and that's just for medicine. So hospital, you know, physicians are a third of the workforce yes. of doctors. So clearly, we need more GPs. Clearly, we yeah. need more psychiatrists, emergency medicine, radiologists. So you probably need to be talking about doubling the number of medical students, if you were just going to be talking about a medical workforce and we don't know where the role of advanced clinical practitioners how that's going to develop but they were drawing on the nursing workforce which as you yeah. say is is really under the the cosh as well um physician associates that's that's a new breed of healthcare professional that we are just beginning to understand you know the college is, yeah, has a faculty of physician associates we're there to try and support them but how they fit into the place, clearly at the moment they're not regulated, and so I would hope that in five years' time they'll be regulated and, and will be able to, to contribute in a very positive way. Um, I, th I, th I think one of the problems with the, with the workforce plan, whatever that has to be, is it has to fit a system mm. that we know that we're working for, and mm -hmm. the NHS sort of generally is, is, is a bit like a, a slinky, it sort of, sort of moves slowly mm -hmm. down, down the stairs under its own mm -hmm. gravity. 
or it's like it's like a bit of bit of slime. It's very amorphous. It's sort of <laughs> sort of it, it, it has no sort of form that people are clear. We need a clear. What do we want the NHS to look like in ten years' time? Yeah. Who's going to be working where? Because then you can start to plan and develop your workforce to that. Uh, and I think because we don't know if 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 it is all going to be sort of based around primary care being the main the main hub. Uh, and that hospitals are going to contract to support more care in the community, that's fine if that's the model, but then mm -hmm. we have to train the workforce to do that. And at the moment, we, we, we're not working to a blueprint. 